at the University of Oregon and the medical school was there mm -hmm. at, uh, at uh, Portland on top of the hill. Mm -hmm. And I was working there for about well, um, if I can, uh, yeah, six months. Mm -hmm. If I can begin the proceedings, uh, Paula suggested quite rightly a brief introduction if we could just go around and ask people to give a small flavor of uh, who yes, we are. That's a good may, idea. May we make you the exception or, or the last at least? Well, I'm not going to say anything very much, but you carry on. Please. Fine. Um, if I can start with just a sort of sure. a comment that um, I'm hard of hearing and there's the fan there and I've picked up already that the tone of this group is going to be low voices. Well, I don't know about that. Thank I'm you. trying to speak out. <laughs> I can kill the fan. That was a pleasure. <laughs> it might be easier. I can kill the fan if the fan alone helps. It's, it may be most it of the air It would help if you turned it off, but if it's going to make everybody, well, you know, I suffer from the, the heat. The primary source. Yeah, the air conditioning yeah. is the main thing. If the fan so if you, you know, no, if I interrupt to make it, ask you to talk louder. It's, it's going to be the end of us all. Right. Would you uh, just ask a little better? And just, just let just us know. If I don't hear, I'll be yeah. yeah. persistent and it'll get us okay, entrained. <laughs> it may take an hour. Christ. If you don't hear, Deborah, please say so. Thanks. You may regret that. <laughs> That's all right. I won't mind your regretting it. Deborah, okay. why don't we ask you to start with a brief. <laughs> At least this way you know I'll hear the first one. Um, okay, I'm Deborah Tannen, and I'm uh, on the faculty of the linguistics department at Georgetown. As we were just discussing, my training is in linguistics at Berkeley, which means, as I just said, that I got a PhD in linguistics without ever reading a word that Chomsky wrote. I don't know if that means anything to any of you. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I didn't know that was possible. Pardon? I didn't know that was possible. It's possible, and it happened. Well, I, I read a little of it later on my own, but it's very possible. Um, the areas of my research have been conversational now discourse analysis would be the general heading and it has included conversational analysis specifically the study of conversational style so cross-cultural communication which uh, in a lot of my research has been New York compared to California so cross-cultural doesn't have to be cross-continental right um, so any you know ethnic social regional differences in conversational style but conversational style as I define it doesn't mean you know frivolous talking with style but it's the very um, bedrock of talk you know how you get meaning and give meaning and talk and and I use Bateson's I've relied a lot on Bateson's theories in in that um, the message and the meta message in that, which we for us uh, comes down to what paralinguistic features I use to signal the meta message. Okay, so my research has been more or less uh, like that, and it's and I've specifically, also in addition to these cross-cultural studies, done work with doctor-patient communication, and recently also spoken and written language, the comparison of that. So that's that's what I do. Jeffrey, I'm Jeff Nickel. I'm a physicist. Although I did read some of Chomsky before I got my PhD in physics, I have been, my primary activity as a physicist has been in cosmology and solid state physics. Although I have been interested for some time in curriculum development, educational policy, and the like. And I suppose that is sufficient. And you are here. And I am here as a part of uh, the noble enterprise on the top of the museum. My name is John Falk, and I'm with the Smithsonian Institution at their Chesapeake Bay Center for Environmental Studies, a little known refuge out on the Chesapeake Bay, about 30 miles due east of here. And I have joint interests in sometimes even trained expertise in both biology and education. And I do research in both. Um, specifically relative to education, I've been real interested in, in learning outside of schools, in places like museums, but not necessarily exclusively. And in biology, I started out real interested in man altered and managed environments, things like lawns, vacant lots, places like that. And, uh, but lately have gotten real interested in the evolution of information 
as a mechanism for understanding um, an awful lot of the variability we see in nature. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, John Dixon, I, I uh, got interested in the subject 20 years ago when I was in the Foreign Service and was assigned the responsibility of producing an exhibit on medicine to go to the Soviet Union. So I called on my colleagues at CIA and said, what are they interested in? And they said, brain research and cybernetics. So I discovered Warren McCullough and Gordon Pat and a few other people. And uh, I continue to be interested in it and witness my being here with you this afternoon. Thank you. And I'm Paul Trackman, and I'm acting as science editor of uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, but really here because I'm trying to help the Cybernetics Society revive a publication we'll call Cybernetics. And uh, I'm interested particularly now in how cybernetics can contribute some organizing ideas to many different fields of contemporary science and social policy social thinking, uh, where conventional ways of looking at what's going on don't seem to produce very satisfying forms of action, let's say. Something like that. Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Pangaro. My background is in uh, computer science and performing arts, specifically theater. And uh, knew Jeff Nichol uh, in the old days of MIT. Together? Those things together? Sure. <laughs> sure. I was always fascinated by cognitive sciences, but I never liked psychology because I didn't understand where it was approaching from, nor the results it got. And I was trying to combine an interest in communication and things like computer graphics and computer simulations, uh, and interest in cognitive sciences, but didn't have a way to knit them all together. And finally ran into Gordon and Gordon's work, and saw an extraordinary synthesis there of all of these things and started pursuing him and pursuing work with him, which we're now doing under joint contracts with the Army Research Institute here and the British Ministry of Defense, which is why Jeffrey's here working away on these things all together. And this is why we constantly mention the ARI, Army Research Institute, because we have these uh, contracts in what I think should be briefly described, if I may fall, which would be expert systems. Uh, not from the artificial intelligence approach, but from a cybernetic approach based on Gordon's work. And the three elements are training, computer-based training. Secondly, uh, computer-aided operations, where an individual trying to perform a specific task in the task situation, not practicing, but really doing it, needs help operating it. He needs to say, well, gee, I forgot how to do this, how do I do that? Uh, or, uh, oh my god, it's an emergency, bail me out, or whatever. The, the machine expert system helps in this situation. And finally, and, and probably the most, uh, the hardest aspect to get a handle on, is that of planning, strategic tactical planning, where you want to use the computer device with its interfaces to help you suggest plans to see whether the plans are consistent with how it's been going, and indeed to help you examine your plans compared to other people's plans compared to your plans a minute ago. And these are the three areas of expert systems of planning, operation, <coughs> and training. And the training area is an interest of ours for education because obviously it's the whole education kit and caboodle all together, which is why Jeffrey's great to have here because of his strong interest in teaching and so on. And this is what we are here in this specific space to do. Uh, some work has uh, done with the museum, as you can imagine, because they're interested in some of these same areas. And uh, that's the group. That is all of us. And I'm also uh, obviously interested in the cybernetics effort uh, with the magazine and Paul and, and that whole thing. And a co editor of the organizer of this whole thing. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen I am Gordon Pask. Uh, I have no name, no attitude at all. Uh, I have a recent song. Uh, one of my trades. Another trade is to be a thing called a professor or something, but it's uh, fortunately not a very eminent one. And uh, it deals with cybernetics in some parts of the world, with architecture and others, uh, with information theory and others, 
with uh, psychology and cognitive studies and others, uh, touches on biology, slaps high into social anthropology, and evolution of environments. So Gregory Bateson, yes, Margaret Mead, and Gregory, and uh, the, I don't mean the dean, um, what's his name, uh, Rappaport, but the Royal Rappaport is the Barga guy. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm mean, sorry for making an inquiry just in case. Well, you it. Well, I notice how a pitch of voice, then it is perhaps not too bad. That's fine, thank you. And I operate in the um, UK, uh, in Montreal, Concordia, uh, and in um, Washington here, and uh, in Amsterdam to some extent. Or, around and about the many lux countries. Well, good. Fine. Shall we... Uh, I, I'll be glad to make an, an initial proposition. Yes, I think you should. The initial proposition is this seems like a very good group for what, what we wanted to do, which is invite out of Gordon and his work some ways of describing what his work is about that would be more accessible and have more obvious relevance to the work of many other people who have not previously encountered it, I think. That seems like yeah. a good goal that's uh, personally of interest to me and I think to most of the people here, but maybe extensible way beyond the room. And so, I have no particular plan as to how that could happen best, and I think that each of us might have at it and suggest a, a format. I can make my suggestion uh, initially is simply that perhaps we get Gordon to spend some time today outlining the facets of his work as they lead up to current interests in conversation theory, uh, discourse theory. but. Tell us a little bit about the particulars, uh, as as you, Gordon, see see the the pieces of relevance, so that we can understand what you've been doing as well as what you're thinking now, or what you've been doing that has led you to think what you're thinking, and maybe then we can interact with that as you go along. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I hope we do because otherwise we will go on at uh, impolite length and improvised repetition. So please uh, let it be a seminar, not a spiel, even though it sounds like a spiel. <laughs> well, let me it's not intended to be. Let me just add to that that I have read some of your papers with great care, mm -hmm. and I've heard you talk before. Some of the people here have not read any of your papers mm -hmm. or, or met you before, but that since I'm not formally trained just speaking for myself in some of the fields that you are that you have developed a good deal of expertise in I personally find it very much easier to understand what you say when I hear you tell stories and I haven't heard you tell very many stories about your research or your experiences in research and so to the extent that I can encourage you to tell us something about what you have done in a given occasion here and a given occasion there that's led you to come up with the wonderful formalisms, I would be very much in favor of that. I love, I love listening to stories. Okay. Uh, stories are fine. I, I presume, I say this with diffidence, was one thing I would like to have questioned by this group of people is the universality and validity of Newtonian maps i.e. not in string models of how things occur. So if I ask you in a historical sequence, it's obviously a nonsense question. I mean, that is how I believe you'd like it though. I don't know. I don't well, I'm not asking for I mean a roughly sequence. historical sequence. I mean it could come as a I have no predilection for historical no. sequence. I think that uh, my invitation to you is to put it in any sequence you would well, like. Once upon a time whatever time is, the, 
I was in showbiz uh, as a professional. I was not in it in a very uh, elaborate sense. I ran cabarets uh, called Late Night Reviews. Uh, this is after I had finished playing at school boys uh, and had finished playing at mining engineers. And um, at that stage I also uh, commuted back and forth in Cambridge and was there interested in both the natural sciences and, and moral sciences. So I got a flavor, a touch of both. And I was known as an inventor. Uh, during the war, I was responsible for inventing a most lethal weapon, which I believe was manufactured with some hazard. At any rate, it blew up a laboratory at the school. Um, I don't know <laughs> whether it was ever used in, in anger against anything but the school. Uh, the, uh, it, it, it was a widely publicized thing because of all the those sort of whiz stories you get in crisis times and crisis times. And uh, it's a sort of relief to the public to see something which is, is funny. Um, and um, I've been a sort of inventor all along, I guess. Uh, now, this is not a scientist, for heaven's sakes. An inventor is, is quite a different career. Uh, and uh, invent ideas or invent drawings or invent realities in the sense of tangible concrete realities and uh, does both. So this carried over perfectly well into inventing songs, stories, and so on. Um, meanwhile, as I say, I was in fact at, at, at Cambridge and I was doing these academic disciplines and their beauty attracted me. Uh, particularly the beauty of the natural sciences. And I studied under Bartlett in psychology, um, and uh, Adrian in physiology, I guess, and Braithwaite in philosophy, and with a lot of good friends. And they used to commute down four, three, four times each week, London, and run the shows. Uh, the first essay in science, apart from doing the usual exercises required of uh, a moderately successful undergraduate, um, with prior experience in mining engineering of all things, uh, was to, was to um, put on some shows and see the possibility of what the cybernetics was about. It happened that just before uh, the first edition of Wiener's Cybernetics, uh, the great man himself uh, arrived in Bartlett's establishment. And one of the duties you did if you worked there was to go make coffee. So I went and made coffee for this man who Bartlett said was sitting in a chair with a cigar which was going to burn him into, into to wakefulness and he was asleep. Uh, this is not apocryphal. Any of you who have seen Wiener, this one is absolutely true. The guy would seem to be absolutely out of this world. But, in fact, he was perfectly alert to anything at all. And uh, I arrived with his coffee as he was removing the cigar, and he said, Thank you, boy. Something of the sort. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, departed very rapidly. But I became, it seemed to me that when I, I read and heard what he was on about, um, that he was giving a name to many of the things which uh, I'd essayed before under no particular name whatsoever. Uh, namely, to Wiener, and I knew him better later on in Napoli, where he was much more human person than, than he is, he was, I believe, in, uh, in MIT. A uh, much more accessible person. and. He was very kind. He tutored me a great deal in, in, in mathematics, for example, in, in Napoli, whereas he maintained a certain distance, I think, for, except his immediate friends, in MIT. There was a different atmosphere with Cagnello. And uh, this confirmed the impression, which was later on in life, when I'd started a research company, system research, 
and uh, had temporarily ceased to do very much in showbiz, excepting to devise a thing which I thought was a cybernetic invention. This may be worth describing. Uh, Bobby McKinnon Wood, my partner and I, uh, toured this gadget around. In fact, eventually we toured one and had one installation in London. Superficially, it looked like a light show. Uh, you played music and some lights went on and off and so on. In fact, it wasn't quite so, it wasn't quite so stupid as that. Uh, it wasn't just like an electric apple or its later modifications. Uh, it was a device for learning about variation on the part of a musician. And the test for this was to do what in those days was quite difficult, to obtain a piece of magnetical tape and uh, a loop of it. Just uh, when tape recorders, you know, there was one drum dig machine, I think, out, and some very expensive reel-to-reel -reel recorders that always spewed the contents across the floor. And uh, you had to run them at 12 inches a second or something, or have seven and a half times two, seven and three quarters times two, whatever that is, for 15 inches a second to get a decent quality. Uh, but anyhow, it was more noise free than, I mean, noise in the sort of Shannon sense, than uh, a gramophone record would be with its needle scratch. And uh, there weren't yet any long playing records. It was a modern invention. Records were things you sat on and they broke rather than bent. And it um, was tested by taking Victor Sylvester, who is a particularly rhythmic, uh, old style, uh, well, moderately old style, nowadays I guess old style, uh, ballroom dance band, and taking a repeat of Victor Sylvester on a tape and playing this darn thing into the machine and tuning it up until such moment as it gave zero output. Okay. And that was a test of the thing. It then reacted to various features rather like Gary Litvin's much more recent and much more beautiful and much more well thought out model of the amphibian eye or for that matter the amphibian nose. Uh, it looked at attributes, but just like some of the amphibia do, I believe, and I inquire here, it could tune its filters as well. So it had a bug detector, but not only could it vary the threshold of the bug detector, it could change the velocity and motion of the bug it had. Well, it's detected things like rhythm, attack, pitch, various sorts. Can I draw you out on sure. that? One? Sure, sure, sure. You're saying that you have a machine and the machine has a number of different features that it can look at. Yeah. For example, one aspect of the machine might be looking at its rhythm. Mm -hmm. Another aspect might be looking at pitch and so on. Yeah. Now within one given feature, let's take the rhythm feature, it's listening to the rhythm and mm -hmm. it begins actually to anticipate... It scans the intervals, so it hooks on, syncs on. It was based on a slightly earlier invention called the musical piano which had the, the only interesting part about which part, which is simply a piano roll cutter, was that it, it keyed in to a metronome. So instead of having play to a metronome, you wanted to get musical notation out of a keyboard, the metronome adapted to the pianist, and it was meant for dance band scoring. Right. Now, that, that was an earlier thing. But that was earlier, yeah. It was adapted but it's the same way, uh, same sort of adaptation, in fact. Right. But here, what it was trying to do was look at the rhythm, yeah. the rhythm that was going on, sure. and in fact, to measure the variation of the rhythm yeah. in the course of play. Yeah, from the norm, it used to, it had to take a punctuation point. Right. Now, in a frequency domain, it, for example, would be looking at the repetition in, say, just the high frequency band. Yeah, just uh, 8KC to 9KC or 5KC to 4KC or whatever, but it would adapt the filter with the band pass well, about 1KC up and okay. down the frequency range. So and hang on, that, that's a different aspect of it. Yeah. So the first aspect is to look at each attribute, yeah. say a rhythm and say a particular range of frequency, yeah. and to try and anticipate how much of that you're getting. Can I put it that mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. And what would the machine do in response to how much it got? 
<laughs> it, it would modulate uh, eventually. Um, first of all, it, it did its own search. Uh, the, this is the first thing it did internally, and it's important to note that. It controlled a search with a kind of primitive optimizer of some sort. Uh, and the, first of all, it controlled the search from the outputs, and it did an averaging of level and so forth, and averaging amplitude. Um, in other words, it had a diode and a capacitor in it. Well, no, this is important, so we know what we're on about. And it then looked at these things to maximize variation in each one of them, and then over the whole lot. Okay. So that, for example, if there were three, usually, filters for pitch, they both might, two of them might be at the same crossover, uh, overlapping. They might be and they the were then torn range. apart and put in different places. Now, what it did was to take uh, a mag slip type servo attached to each of the scanning operations, which was a so called bi directional unison, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, I guess you remember them. Uh, they were used quite widely in some telephone exchanges, and they uh, unit selectors that step back and forth, and uh, use that to modulate one aspect of a display, and use the intensity values which are driving the search to modulate another aspect of the display. And the display was presented, of course, to the performer, or the group of performers. And Group is particularly interesting because I'd like to speak a word on, on that if I may later. Can you so you can imagine? Oh, sorry. Can sorry. you just say a word about what form of display was it? Graphic well, display or? for example, I uh, had a cyclorama, and uh, one could have mag slip driven spots, or things over the spot spot wheels. What's mag slip driven? Uh, mag slip is simply a, device, a three phase device which um, used to be widely used. They contain junk. Uh, in radar, and it's uh, a means of transmitting by an appropriately wound three-phase magnetic device uh, a motion to a remote magnetic device. Oh. And, uh, so we're so, varying yes. the, the brightness yeah. of the light, or no? This is a way of varying the form of the light. In the in the case of, I'm citing of of, of of a display which consists in a theatrical a theater cyclorama or a series of curtains actually in front of the site. Uh, the things modulated by the other outputs would be the intensity, usually, of lighting sources or groups of lighting sources. And this, of course, is a matter of, of artistry as to whether the thing looked good. Mm -hmm. But whether or not it looked good, it was certainly, whatever the case, visible. Uh, and it was visible to the performer or performers at that moment. So they were trapped in a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Now I became quite interested in this thing, did several shows with it, and also uh, got terribly intrigued with... Can I ask you one more second? Yeah, sure. I'm not sure that you've said exactly what the machine looks at and then feeds back to the uh, performer. It looks at one or more microphones situated adjacent to the performer uh, to hearing the instrument. But the device itself is looking for variation. Can you talk yes. a little more about what for, it does when it finds looking variation? Looking for performance variation. On the assumption, first of all, it's a closed loop device. Mm -hmm. um, and an externally closed loop device. So it's looking at the performer's performance. And if that performance was completely uniform, like a Victor Sylvester record, it would eventually produce no output. OK, so if I'm absolutely perfectly rhythmic, the yeah. machine essentially stops listening. For example, if you're playing concert pianist, it will stop. Fine. Unless you're playing something very, very complicated. Fine. <laughs> it goes outside its tape length. Mm -hmm. uh, the <coughs> and it, it would do if you repeat, repetitively bang the piano or a chord or a drum or whatever. And um, it will gradually just die out into quiescence. You are not making any variation or improvisation upon a theme. And um, to give another example of a display, uh, the one class of outputs, the things that determine search position, what it's looking at, uh, can be used to rotate forms. 
bits of scenery on a stage, preferably reflect, reflecting bits of some kind, or shadow casting bits. Uh, and in this case, again, the lighting would be modulated through a rather explosive thyrotron and such a reactor onto, uh, onto or behind or against or whatever these pieces of mobile moving scenery. Um, often there was a performer on the stage too, and an alternative input was to scan the stage for a single dancer and follow the single dancer in uh, a written there which Marv Minsky gave me of Rosenblatt's first perceptron, I think, which uh, is not very high resolution, but uh, it used that thing, scan that, give an image, scan the thing around, centralizes the so whole retina mass of photocells on the position of a single dancer, got stuck at the bottom one. And, uh, well, because I haven't got two scanners, uh, and uh, looked at the movement uh, in, as given just by that trivial pattern, arbitrary pattern. Now, in either case, in either type of display or either type of input, the machine was essentially doing the same thing, looking for variation. Uh, it wasn't the case that you rewarded it or something and pressed it, good machine, pressed the button saying, good machine, you, you're, you're reinforced. Uh, you could have done that very easily and trivially. Uh, we did do that very easily and trivially, and it turned out to be quite unsuccessful. Because what was going on when you closed the loop and the performer, or in the case of musical performance, several performers, uh, were trapped in this feedback loop, which was a display that covered their whole visual angle. There was no way of escaping from it. And this again was a necessity. It couldn't be a peaky little screen someplace. It just didn't work. What happened was, of course, that the performer was entrained in a nonlinear, multiple mode oscillator, which had uh, actually infinite storage capacity, depending upon how long you like to take the oscillations going on. This is reminiscent of the pretty part of, and I guess to some extent they've been copied from, the pretty part of Gray Walter's early tortoise models which had a long-term store, which was much more like a memory, and uh, which consisted in, in recall in terms of oscillatory mode. And uh, so it's dangerous now, having completed the loop, to talk about input to the machine or output from the machine. However, there was some interesting and fairly consistent result. Fairly consistent. Uh, Take a group that improvised, and typically at the Mechalacano, where I had to manage the nightclub as well as the as the music color installation, and um, we'd have one new group being tried out on a revolve, a big band, and a uh, well established small band. And they'd the revolve would go round and we did this for the new group only. Because generally they did improvise, they did play to the dancers. And uh, if they were any good, you know, they were had, this is the idea, but they were put on trial. And um, here you've got some very intriguing effects that I had to call it the Red Cross ones because people got completely sort of disoriented and partly seasick and um, partly, I'm not quite sure what the melody would be classified by, it was fortunately transient, um, made them go fainting out. <laughs> and um, the, 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 the phenomena like this, uh, group kind, was this simply in a sense to amplify the activities of a transaction going on between a genuinely improvising band and the and people on the floor, and the lighting to which they were both excuse subject. Excuse me, you're saying that the band responding to the dancers would improvise, yes. which would then, because it was a change, a variation, yes. would change the lighting oh, yeah. in some manner, yeah. which would then cause the yeah. dancers to do something yeah. different. That's right. 
or to feel differently yeah. about how they're dancing. Yeah. And so forth. Yeah. And so occasionally you got that the thing became unpleasant. Or Quite disturbing. unpleasant, apparently. Uh, actually, some people found it great. Some people found it very unpleasant. And well, some well, people well, painted well, out. The sufferers, the dancers or the musicians? Musicians never suffered. The musicians, it acted, I never met one who suffered. It acted to small groups, uh, they would allude to it as a sort of conductor. But of course it wasn't a conductor, but it's a good metaphor. So the Soviets have good reason for resisting rock music. At the risk of uh, linearizing it a bit too much, can I drop back just for an instant and describe in detail one, one way it might go in using the device, because I think it might be useful. I'm, I'm playing rhythmically, and I'm playing as rhythmically as I can. The device, as one was saying, eventually quiets down because it, it knows that I'm being rhythmic. So in a sense, it gets bored. It doesn't look at what I'm doing anymore. But another aspect of the device will actually amplify and look at a finer and finer grain. And tell me if I'm going wrong here, Gordon. It will amplify to the point where it now notices that slight variation that must be there because I am not a perfect metronome. Yep. And so if every time I touch, it's playing back a light, that's fine. But then as I, as the, the device needs to get more and more sensitive to see the variation that I'm there, it amplifies that variation back to me. So it anticipates me and maybe gives it to me a little bit ahead of when I hit it. Yeah. But it's amplifying how far off yeah. I am. So, so it looks at the variation and it amplifies the variation. And then I can look at that and say, ah, well, I ride the crest of its ability to see what is a slight variation in my hand. And then I can go with it. So the machine, if you were endeavoring to be perfectly rhythmical, would eventually become quiescent and it would again become a... It would actually, the only reason it would eventually become quiescent is, of course, that it had a, a lower level of, mm -hmm. of, of both of, of duration and of, of noise in the system. But it could adjust uh, But it, until such moments it reached that, yeah. it would do exactly as Paul says. There are a couple of things going on. One is the amplification of this is a gain control. Excuse me, I still don't understand okay. it. If you were endeavoring to be perfectly regular, mm -hmm. it's it would event it would its activity would begin to cease and then it would seek it would yes. seek to amplify the gain. So so the if I was just observing that the lights were doing something or not, they would be doing something for a while while it established what my regularity was, mm -hmm. then yeah. the activity of the lights would diminish yeah. because it was assessing me as regular. In the meantime, it would be, it would be changing its game, looking for variations, right. and therefore its activity would begin to increase. Right. Sure. Okay. All right. Now, there's, there's another thing going on. Which... By, in your model mm -hmm. of reaching a stage where, as a performer, you would go with it. Well, see, if, if I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm doing something and I am a little bit off, I may not really notice it. But if the device amplifies that little bit to more, mm -hmm. such that I see it, then maybe I, I go with it and I slow down more, mm -hmm. or I speed up more. And you listen to it and try to become more regular. Perhaps. Or indeed, I, or the other way. Okay, but the thing is that what it's doing is it's pointing out to me things that I can't detect yeah. until it does, and then I go with it, and I think that's how it traps you in. Mm -hmm. The other thing that it does, and the other aspect we haven't really talked about much, although Gordon implied it in one of his earlier sentences, is if if it doesn't really, if it doesn't have enough gain to find enough variation, and the rhythm thing, it's easy to understand how it could pretty much always find variation. But in terms of pitch, let's say you have a lot of high frequency stuff, hmm. you know, because it's because its filter is always looking at the high frequency, then it's then it probably will get bored. Well, then it stops looking at the high frequency and it brings its filter down into the lower frequencies again, looking for variation. Sure. And when it finds the variation, and then amplifies. The response well, it to seems you. crucial that what you're saying is that it shifts from reflecting your variation to affecting it, shaping it. Close it. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's it's self-reflection of what you think you are, but amplification of how you deviate from your image of what you are is the idea. That is mm -hmm. the idea behind it. So mm -hmm. it's not exactly an other referent because it becomes part of your own self-reference system, but it's acting like a sort of Gedanken other referent in a dialogue. It makes so, me think of the um, 
kinds of, uh, of behavior, behavioral modification of the MRI so you know you know the people in Stanford brief therapy mm -hmm. that is totally based I think on Bateson's theories of uh, yeah. groups that you you know find a, a, a close yeah. system yeah, mm -hmm. find bind, yeah you find someone doing mm -hmm. some behavior mm -hmm. that's uh, that's not productive so rather than trying to change the behavior you reinforce them for doing what they don't know they're doing, but you reframe it, and then they start thinking, oh, I'm doing that, and start doing it. Yes. It's the same yes. thing. Yes. Um, I think Gregory would have agreed that this is, uh, I don't like this word, have. <laughs> I think Gregory would agree. I would have agreed, I said. The guy is dead, unfortunately. But I don't like this, this uh, notion, have agreed. <laughs> I don't like the past tense. <laughs> And um, it, uh, it did agree, in fact, does agree, I imagine still, that uh, the, um, it, it was very much doing what he does in double bind theory of that matter, Ronnie Lang does in, in his IPM type theory, the theory behind the mm -hmm. IPM. Uh, it's, uh, yes. So it's identifying a behavior that yeah. before wasn't identified. Yeah. Could you say that again, if you recall how you phrased it, I like the description. It's self-reflection of what you think you are. Mm. And finish that. It amplifies the deviation between what you are and what you think you are. I like that. Yeah. And I might add, of course, there are two limits to this, that because the poor thing is only a machinery, uh, one thing, namely, no variation counts as null, and one special case of no variation is nothing. Yes. Stop playing. He's quite happy with that too. Yeah, that's no variation at all. And presumably it eventually, as you said, the, the, the amount of variation disappears into it, the noise, and mm. so it has to be a discernible yeah, variation. it has to. So it, because otherwise, if you imagine yeah. it to be if yeah. capable of amplification, it would just... Well, it would be infinite rather yeah. than... Yeah. And I it mean, would, it would be, also drive... It, it would be trying to be regular. It would gener it genuinely... Would drive you yeah. mad because sure. you, you cannot... If, if, if it could notice variations yeah. in a microsecond, but you could not modulate your own activity within that, it would be continually driving you off of what you were doing. Because it would be trying yeah. to go faster, yeah. and you would be going... You would go too much faster, it would say go slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wouldn't really work. That's why I think you need this variable gain. Yes, but the, the gain, the, the gain had better stop. I mean, or or, yeah. or disappear into noise. Yeah, the, or, or the, it, becomes, it, it would become something that yeah. you could not ever keep it null. Can because I ask? Would be too yeah. Can I ask? Uh, we'll take the glass, reduce the cutoff point, the usual ambient noise level of the yeah. environment. And then, and then it would, yeah. it, it, yeah. it would, yeah. it would accept that yeah. amount of variation. Yeah. But then take it not as variation. Now, what would happen to the machine after it had got? <coughs> to where it was limited in that sense, that is to say the amount of variation present was not discernible. What does it then do? It just accepts that. But you yeah. said that every time it found no variation, it punted. When, it, when it finds no variation, when it finds nothing, which is a fortiori variation. But you said that when it, when it has it, another aspect of it, not unlike the homeostat, which I don't know whether that's what you got it, Gordon, would actually would, would look for other features. The easiest way to think about that one is not the rhythm example, but in the uh, frequency example, where it has a bandpass filter. And if it's looking at high frequency and it finds no variation, it finds continuous mm -hmm. high frequency, then it would shift and it would look elsewhere okay, for but what more would the rhythm one do? Well, look, I'm not sure. Just, and when it could no longer change its gain. There's a funny thing about this machine, sure. though, that comes in the, the two languages that that I've just heard, that one well, of which seems acceptable to the group, and I think the, the two different things going mm -hmm. on. One is, from your description, of the, especially in the frequency case, it sounds like what this machine wants to do, if we can talk about that, mm -hmm. is search out variation and continue to find it when it doesn't find it. On the other hand, you were talking about, a moment ago, the machine coming to the case of nothing and stopping and being happy with that. I thought that was a funny word. Well, in this case, see, if, if the machine is, is yeah. if the performer is a portion of it, you know, the question is, for example, what if I put a performer in there and he decides to, he could do, he could have different things he wants to do. He could try to make the machine uh, produce the most violent of light shows. 
at which point he tries to be as irregular as possible. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't really matter how the machine, when, when the machine decides there isn't any variation because the performer is, 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 is trying to be as erratic as possible. And so presumably the machine never has to uh, shift. Uh, the learning process, John Perry, who was our musical director, was uh, adept amongst other people, but she chiefly because she went around with the touring show at training the machine. She get it to whatever she liked. So she she mm. could modulate her performance no. No. To, no. To, no. to produce no. a light performance. Yeah, even with a strange display put up. Yeah. Well, that, that would be the case. I mean, the question heard. is, let's suppose that you took a simple task of training the machine, is you just don't want it to do anything. Now, you could, you could make it not do anything by being totally quiet. Yes. But the question is, let's suppose you require that you make a performance, that is to say you are producing sound that uh, someone else agrees that you are playing, that it's audible, you're doing something, but you want